you don't deserve to go to the next level until you beat the current one. And that's just life. That's Eric Sue, investor, founder, advisor, and author of Leveling Up. There's a circle in there and success is on all the edges of the circle. You start in the middle of it. If you just go in one direction, you're going to hit success faster. You're going to reach one of the edges. But if you keep changing directions, it's much harder to get to one of the edges to reach quote unquote success. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp Video, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Eric Sue to discuss how he's reframed pain into opportunities to ride the rough winds and persevere, how he ditched ego and embraced an apprentice mentality, and how he's applied the lessons he's learned as a professional gamer to scale multiple successful businesses. I spent a lot of time in my life gaming, and I've intersected that with marketing, which I think is a game, and also business, which I think is the ultimate game. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Eric Sue is the CEO of Single Grain and has worked with companies such as Amazon, Uber, and Salesforce to help them acquire more customers. He's also the host of two top-rated podcasts that accrue millions of downloads every month and has compiled the lessons he's learned into his latest book, Leveling Up, How to Master the Game of Life. But before becoming a major force in the business world, Eric got his start as a competitive esports gamer. I think for me, from ages 8 to 22, the only thing I really excelled at was games. And I, I didn't know at the time, but I was learning a lot of stuff that you learn from sports, teamwork, uh, resilience, communication. Um, you know, I even learned to type really fast because at the time you couldn't uh, speak into a microphone. At my high point, I can type up to 144 words per minute now, so I can work a lot faster now. But my point is, there's a lot of skills I gained from that. And then, you know, I went into to the world of gaming. I call it the shadow world to train. And I came back out of it. And then now I am utilizing a lot of those skills. It's just like when you train in football or basketball, you can overtrain. You can tear your ACL or blow out your, your muscles, right? But um, a lot of those skills apply to real life, right? Real life. And to me, the ultimate game is business. So I, I think it's really important for people to understand you have 3 billion people in the world that have played a game. Could be Tetris, could be Duck Hunt, could be Fortnite, whatever. And there's still a stigma tied to it, but now we all know it's inevitable. And so I have this weird intersection where I spent a lot of time in my life gaming, and I've intersected that with marketing, which I think is a game, and also business, which I think is the ultimate game. And so the way I look at life right now is, you know, every single day when I'm waking up, I'm trying to power up in the morning, right? So for me, like all the cliches you hear about meditation, you know, working out, you know, fasting, you know, sleep optimization, all this stuff, right? So like by the time I've powered up in the morning, I've got like six buffs stacked on me, right? So you know, when you play these games, people will cast spells on you. You can increase your intellect. You can increase your strength and all that shields and all that. And that's how I feel, right? I'm like stacking my buffs every morning and then I'm off. Right. And so to me, leveling up is just getting 1% better every single day. And, um, if you look at life as just a game and puzzles, if I'm trying to invest in a company, I'm looking at, okay, how can I make the terms favorable to us, but also make it a win for them? And then how do I creatively mess around with the puzzles to make it like a super good deal? Right. Or if I'm looking to hire someone amazing, how do I attract them? How do I sell the company? How do I incentivize them properly? There's so many puzzles within everything. And so that's how I look at it. And it just makes things fun. And I, I don't look at life as a zero or business as a zero sum game. You can keep expanding the pie and you know, you don't have to look at it that way. And I think, you know, a lot of people, especially I would say kind of uh, maybe in the affiliate marketing world, I think they're very smart, but there's a level of short termism, right? And that's actually the world that I initially started learning marketing from. But eventually I learned that, you know, studying the best investors in the world, that if you actually have a longer term mindset, things actually end up a lot better. That all ties back into this leveling up thing and, and kind of changing the mindset, changing how you think and also changing your habits. 
Yeah, and I, I want to just briefly spend some time because we talk about this even before we started the podcast around like the stigma of gaming and, and how it was when many of us were growing up as kids in the sense that it wasn't seen the way it is today. Like, the, you know, esports wasn't what it was today. If you were a gamer, you're playing video games that could be regarded as like a waste of time as opposed to now when you look at it, these guys are almost like athletes and the level of camaraderie, teamwork, dedication, commitment that it takes. And even some of the recent esports events are getting more distribution and more viewership than even the Super Bowl. So for those that aren't don't know about that, if if you could elaborate. Yeah, I mean, if we look at the growth of things over time, you know, gaming was dismissed as a toy. Bitcoin was dismissed as a toy. NFTs right now are dismissed as a toy. As of this recording, you can argue it's a bubble. So this is kind of related to the the blockchain. But you see stuff selling like virtual goods selling for millions of dollars, right? It's nuts. But you know, Snapchat was initially initially dismissed as a toy. And now it's a $100 billion market cap. Now it's called Snap. So I think everything goes through these different cycles. And, you know, now if you search, you know, any of these games, you search esports and Google Trends, or you look at, um, you know, just kind of the, the viewership numbers on these championships for, for League of Legends, as an example, they're much bigger in other countries. The United States is actually lagging behind, but I, I do think esports will be a, a top three, you know, quote unquote sport, you know, long term. People aren't going to look at it as traditional, but we now know it's inevitable because so many people grow up playing games. So, you know, I think it's either you embrace trends like this or you kind of keep trying to push against it. Uh, For me, you know, one of the chapters I talk about the apprentice mentality, but it's basically having very strong opinions or very strong views, but holding them very loosely and then being very ready to change on a dime if you have new data. I think most people are just too stubborn. And really towards the beginning of the book, you talk about the fact that you know, early on, you were a disappointment in the eyes of your parents, didn't really care much for school, uh, weren't, weren't very good at, you know, at sports. But you tie this into the fact of the importance of having a clear mission and purpose and, and really being able to go in on something. I guess if you could speak to that in the sense that, you know, you weren't very good at school because that didn't have a clear objective to you versus with games, you know, there was always a clear objective and you knew what you were fighting for. I think one of the ultimate forms of leverage is, you know, we talk about having an audience, building an audience, but I think even better than that is building a community because people in the community are all interacting with each other versus having an audience. Everyone's kind of looking up to you. So, you know, for me, when I was about 11 or 12 years old, I played this game called EverQuest. That's probably the first time in my life where I felt like I was doing something bigger than myself, where I was called upon, I was needed. We'd all arrive on time, 6 p.m. to do a job. And we sometimes we play until 2 a.m. because we would go on these dragon raids and sometimes it wouldn't go well and we all die and then it become late nights. But I felt like I was needed, wanted. I was part of a, you know, the top team. I learned how important it is to be part of the top team to do the best stuff, right? It's same thing in real life. Also, look. 11, 12 year old kid, I was playing with people that were lawyers, people that own wealthy people that own jets. And I was playing with mostly college students beyond, and, and beyond. So I felt like, oh, look, I, it feels good to be acknowledged. It feels good to be part of a community. That's what was important to me at the time. And that's what told me to kind of keep going because I, you know, I didn't feel that way in, in, in real life because I'm just like the school thing. Like it doesn't feel right to me to have to follow this recipe and kind of get churned out like like sausage at the end. It just didn't intuitively it didn't feel right. Right. The gut feeling didn't feel right. That's what it was. And that's what kept me going. And now when I think about everything that I'm doing, you know, even with this book, this whole leveling up thing, if the book becomes successful, I think we're going to form a brand new community. And I think it's going to be very strong. And I do think, look, there's going to be a subset of the 3 billion people in the world that have played games, right? So that's the bet that I'm making. But if you look at it, same thing, it's a long term bet, right? Which is why I don't care so much. And this is going off on a tangent a little bit, but I don't care so much about getting the New York Times immediately or the Wall Street Journal's bestsellers immediately, right? I think if it's actually a good book, they'll do that over time. And in the book, you talk a lot about power ups. How do you define those? Yeah, to me, power ups are, you know, you, you go around in life. Um, and so those of you that have played games, you might, you know, pick up a, a, a sword, like a really magical or legendary sword, right? And you're, you're collecting different armor, and then you're leveling up, you're getting stronger and stronger. And so to me, we do have in person power ups, I talked about the power ups in the morning, right? It could be a mental power up it could be a physical power up. So to me, it's really habits and it's mental models. So you know, a lot of people make decisions. Here's an example of a mental model uh, talking about second and third order consequences. So look, if I make this short term decision to try to pull as much profit out of my customers, what are the second and third order consequences? Are they going to come back? Are we going to make them feel good? You know, if not, then maybe we should reconsider how we're thinking about these things. Right. So, you know, that's one example. But again, a physical one would be just simple as um, intermittent fasting or, you know, training in the morning, right? I, but I think a lot of these habits need to, or power-ups need to constantly be rebuilt because if you keep swinging a sword over time, it's going to lose durability and you have to repair it, right? Or sometimes it breaks. It's a constant balance. 
But I think if, if every day just look at, hey, like I'm trying to get these buffs in the morning, it's a mental reframe thinking, oh, like that's not so bad. I'm just getting a little stronger so I can start my day off and I can perform the best for my loved ones and also for the people that I'm working with. And I love that you spent a lot of time in the book talking about mindset. So there's, you go back to your days, the er, the other type of gaming, which is, you know, your poker days. And you mentioned that in poker, even if you're the best player in the world, you're going to lose at some point. So what, how do you define that basically the differences between the winners and losers as you saw it in poker? Yeah. I mean, poker, I think should be required learning in any school. Um, the reality is just like, you know, maybe it should be required learning, maybe investing some money in the stock market should be required. That's just my opinion. But I learned a lot of power ups and a lot of kind of mental models with with poker. So as an example, like you were just mentioning, you can bring your A game three, six, 12 months at a time, and you can still lose just due to variance. It's just numbers, right? But in the long run, if you have a long term mindset, you'll understand that this is just the math and then this will pass just like with investing. But you can also completely lose your cool. So when I was 19, 20 years old, I'd go to the casino, there's a period of time where I wouldn't lose. And, the, you know, I'd walk in and then the dealers would say, oh, look, it's the kid that never loses. Right. And I thought it was I was the best thing in the world. I won three months in a row. But after that, I lost six months in a row. And then after that, you know, I was losing my cool. Like, by the way, this was money I needed to, like, buy books or like eat. Right. Because my, my parents were funding my, my college. Right. I'm grateful for that. But I was going down a downward spiral. So I was losing all my money. I was playing over my means. Right. So. I didn't know how to control my emotions, but that actually applies directly to real life. So poker taught me resilience. So now whenever like, you know, bad things happen or like, it's funny, sometimes my EA hits me up. It's like, hey, you know, I just want to check in with you. Are you feeling okay? Are you stressed? And I'm like, dude, I don't really stress because poker has trained me. It's beaten me down so much that I'm just like, dude, this is just part of the game. But more than that, you learn about, um, I just talked about investing. You learn to think in bets. So those of you that don't play poker, sometimes you might understand that you might have an edge. If there are multiple people in the hand and you have a very good draw, you actually have an edge on the table. You also understand how to look at people, how to read people as well. And you also understand how to balance your bankroll. So all of these things actually apply to real life and also to investing, which also apply to business. I love that you mentioned when you talk about stress and in the book, you, you mentioned that like worrying is a state of suffering and that it takes your energy without you being able to do anything about the situation. What have been some of the, the habits that you've employed to kind of overcome this? You know, I have this, it's kind of a disgusting reframe. So I'm saying this in a bad way because, um, you know, growing up with, uh, you know, Asian parents, it's, it's, a, it's a constant beat down. And so it's like, it's, this isn't good enough. Look at this kid, you know, look at them versus you look at that. Right. So it, it doesn't feel good growing up. And um, what I learned from that and from poker, it's like, the psychological pain, I can either cry about it or, or get mad or I can like reframe it as fuel. So now when I feel psychological pain, let's say I, I remember um, someone snub, snubbed me for like, you know, they, they invited me to speak at a conference and they like snubbed me. Right. And then they invited me to come to their podcast for, to promote the book. And then last minute they snubbed me as well. So they did it twice. Right. So I was like, OK, I can be mad about it or I can just be like, dude, give me more. Right. So now it's like when there's psychological pain, I'm just like more right? More like whoever talks crap, give me more. Right. And so now there, there's actually a character in world of Warcraft. The more you hit it, the more it gets stronger. And so I'm like, yeah, that's a power up. Give me more. So I think a lot of life is reframing the negative and thinking about how can I actually make this positive? Um, because if I react poorly to it, I'm not the one thing I can control my emotions. It just shows that I haven't truly trained enough yet. So I'm not saying I'm always like hundred thousand percent, you know, I have my mental cool, but a lot more than I ever had in, in kind of my, my early 20s. Eric has seen firsthand the rewards that come with long-term commitment and endurance. I asked him about his experience practicing patience when it came to growing his now highly acclaimed and top-rated marketing podcast. I think as of this recording, maybe it's like 55 million or so. So it, it's compounding, right? And so the reason I'm saying that, and this is not to brag, is saying the first year of the podcast, I was, I was spending six hours a week on it while I was trying to take this, uh, save this company that I just took over, Single Grain. I was spending six hours on it uh, per week and I was only getting 30 down, oh, sorry, nine downloads a day after the first year. So that's 270 a month. And then I did the same thing for the second year and I was only getting 900 downloads a month. Now we're at about 1.6, 1.7 million downloads a month. But that took, you know, to really start to see initial traction, probably two to three years. My point there is, this is a reframe again. If I had just focused on the downloads or the views, then I would have given up. But I learned to reframe to think about, okay, what am I truly getting from this? I'm meeting amazing people. I'm able to ask them questions about kind of saving my business because these are successful business people and I'm building relationships. Those are worth a lot more than any downloads I'm going to get initially. And so the reframe was, oh, 
let's just focus on optimizing for learning. And you know, if it's good, it's going to get better. You know, every month or so I'd get this unsolicited comment, a review saying, I don't know why it's not getting more downloads. I think this is amazing. This changed my life or whatever. I'm like, okay, I think something's going on here. But key point here is most people can't endure. And I would argue that uh, it's a, I'm using a strong word here. It's a selfish mindset to think so much about your downloads because you know, at the end of the day, that's not what matters, right? It's, it's how much value you're actually adding. And it's going to stack over time as long as you stay consistent with, but most people start losing their cool because they're like, Oh my God, three months into it. I'm not getting any traction at all. I'm going to give up. And that's why most people get most people results. I agree hundred percent. Now you've had another chapter about grit, right? Cause there's a chapter on endurance. There's another one about grit. How do you differentiate between the two? Yeah. Endurance is, it's about taking the pain um, so it's being able to endure kind of the pain that's going on. I think grit to me, and they're very similar grit to me is being able to, to power through. Right. So it's one is just, you know, endure, like you have defense up, right. The other one grit is being able to push through the, the wall. So, but the, to me, they're, they're very similar. So. And much of this is you describe, and I agree wholeheartedly, I think even Elon Musk said it, is that so much of entrepreneurship is really pain tolerance. But what you talk about is there is a hack to make this a little bit easier. What, what is that? Everyone that's done something uh, amazing has gone through a certain amount of pain. They've powered through it, um, which is kind of the grit thing that I, that I just talked about. Um, but Elon, of all people, let's use him as an example. After PayPal, $180 million, right? He didn't need to redeploy all that money, but he did redeploy all that money. And he took the, the last of it, I think he had 40 million bucks left, 20 million for SpaceX, 20 million for Tesla. Both of them were on life support. And to make a bet like that, when you don't need to make a bet like that, that's extremely painful. But even before that, like learning physics, thinking about space and thinking about reading all this stuff and learning it on your own. And then going back to first principles, putting the rocket together, all that he's the ultimate bearer of pain. I think one of the best examples in, in our modern world. And on the note of education, so you kind of give like the Warren Buffett example where you talk about building up knowledge, like compound interest. But what types of content do you think people should be exposing themselves to, particularly for business owners? Yeah, I mean, to me, I, I think it's so definitely knowledge compounds. You know, the thing Warren Buffett says, the best investment you can make is in yourself. I used to think mindset, people would say this mindset thing. It's just like, it's so pie in the sky. I used to think it was a bunch of baloney. But then you realize the mindset is just how you think, right? How to think in general. And earlier I mentioned uh, studying mental models, right? So I think there's a blog called Farnham Street. So it's F-A-R-N-H-A-M Street. They have a great podcast as well and they interview great thinkers. Um, I love how Naval Ravikant thinks. So I think following certain people on Twitter because what ends up happening is if you tailor who you follow on Twitter, your mind starts to optimize towards what they say, right? So it's really important to tailor where you're getting your information from and really filter out who makes sense for you. This is just who makes sense for me. So I follow a lot of VCs, a lot of um, philosophical uh, Twitter accounts, and then I kind of use those thoughts to kind of guide you know, my operating system and what works for me. As we get older, I think, um, again, studying philosophy, uh, studying uh, Marcus Aurelius, right? We talk about stoicism, things like that. That's important. And I learned that the older I get, it's, it's less so about, you know, marketing tactics. It's less so about, you know, all these um, sales tactics and, and, you know, other tactics, right? Um, recruiting tactics. It's, it's more so about people talk about strategy, right? But even beyond that, you know, how you think will guide your strategy, which will guide the tactics that you use. So, I think that's what it is. And it's not trying to do too many things at once, because if you get to pull in all these different directions, your mind becomes warped and then you start to kind of disrupt that compound interest. And I want to elaborate on that because there's a chapter on alchemy and you state that like many entrepreneurs, they believe with a great, you know, product or service alone, that will get people to get their wallets out. But it, you state that, it, you know, nothing can be further from the truth. Yeah. I mean, so to me, you know, alchemy, whether you're playing like a game like Diablo or, you know, there, there's always a magic class, right? There, there might be a wizard, a magician or a sorcerer or whatever. Some of these characters, they can create stuff from, from out of nowhere. Right. And that's why I use the word alchemy. Sometimes it's like creating gold out of nowhere. To me, real life alchemy is understanding sales and understanding marketing. And whether you like sales and marketing or not, you know, at the end of the day, we're selling and we're marketing because marketing is bringing people to the point of sale and sales is just closing them. But, you know, you're negotiating every day, whether you're trying to date someone or whether you're trying to close this big deal, you know, those two kind of go hand in hand, right? So it's understanding that, you know, at the end of the day, at least what works for me in terms of marketing is 
learning in public, right? I'm very much a learner teacher. That's my essence. And so that's how we've been able to compound our, our audiences over time. And then eventually it, it becomes because you built so much goodwill and you built um, your, your sales cycle is a lot shorter. The lifetime value is a lot higher. And then there's also a lot of other opportunities because they actually want to become your friend versus just a customer vendor relationship, right? And that's what I think it is. I, I think it's, it's very important to understand, um, you know, alchemy to me, which is sales and marketing, you know, without it, Again, it doesn't matter how good your product is. The reason why Facebook has worked out so well is because it's a network effects business, right? But how did they get that distribution? There's so much they had to do with translations. There's so much they had to do with transferring over to the world of mobile. There's a lot of situations where they could have failed, right? But they understood, okay, where we're going get, to get the best distribution, right? Marketing. And then, um, you know, at the end of the day, can we build a great product, which to me, you know, if you have great product, you can actually close people to using the product more and more, right? But there's a lot of iterating, there's a lot of customer development to do with, with products like that, right? So I'm using a more kind of technical example, but same thing. Another thing that you and I strongly align on, you mentioned that one of the biggest advantages that uh, a business can have is through building a brand. What are some of the ways in which, you know, you encourage brand building and perhaps, you know, providing value? Because I know you, you list off a few different ways to do that. Yeah. So I apologize for the sirens in the back, by the way. Um, so, you know, for, for me, I mean, this is what's worked for me. Um, and what I just mentioned a second ago, if you were to strip me to my essence, I'm just a learner teacher and I would just be doing the same thing. I'd just be learning. I'd be reading a lot. Uh, and then I would be teaching it. Right. So pre COVID I would teach at, um, I'm based in LA. I would teach at USC. I would teach at Pepperdine for free. Right. I just enjoy doing that. But the, the residue from that, right. If you want to call it that is that you start to build an audience. And in tech right now, there's this whole movement around building in public. People are sharing their their revenue numbers. They're sharing kind of, you know, what product, uh, new features they launched, their, their roadmap, and then um, also, you know, some help that they need. So they're being very transparent. But you see these people that are actually building an audience and people just want to see how they're doing and people end up wanting to help. And, you know, again, when I think about the leveling up podcast, it took a long time to build the downloads up. But if I didn't keep going, we wouldn't have the, the marketing school podcast. And now I, I have a new podcast with Yelp called restaurant marketing school, right? But these opportunities will keep popping up as you continue to learn in public and, and, and teach in public. And so for me, that compounds really well. My, my podcast co-host, she's done that for a very long time, Neil Patel. And um, it's just what works for myself and what's, it's what works for him. That's my strength, right? That's my skill. I'm not saying the other stuff, like, you know, going outbound and hitting people up. Like, I think that's valuable as well. But at least for me, that's proven to be the most valuable. And then if I would say for people that um, don't want to learn in public, here's the other thing. I think if you're starting from scratch, you could just document all the stuff that you're doing every day. And if people like what you're doing, if they resonate with you and they like your voice, then great, right? You can either do a podcast, you can do video. I think it's also important to understand uh, where your audience is actually hanging out. If they're hanging out on podcasts, do that. If they're hanging out on YouTube, do that. Your mileage may vary is, is kind of you know my, my overarching answer. Many of us have been victims of shiny object syndrome chasing a new opportunity at the expense of doubling down on an existing one. I asked Eric to elaborate on how minimizing distractions can lead to greater success. You know, I, I use this analogy in, in the book. There's actually an illustration. So there's a circle in there and success is on all the edges of the circle. You start in the middle of it. And um, if you just go in one direction, you're going to hit success faster. You're going to reach one of the edges. But if you keep changing directions, it's much harder to get to one of the edges to reach quote unquote success. So I, I think... What's important, I think, if people are starting out is you want to get a business that's a great launchpad business or a great starter business that can kick you out maybe 200, 300 grand a year in profit, right? To take care of your expenses, take care of your family. Then you have a lot more freedom to go do what you want, right? That's one level of it. Um, you know, you have the job and then the next level is you do your own thing and then you start to build on top of that. You can take the cash flows and reinvest it and start to stack on, but you got to take care of your own expenses first. I think that's the most important thing. And, and then, you know, what I would say is, a lot of people come to me, it's like, oh, you know, should I try this? Should I try that? You know, for example, an agency owner came to me, he's like, oh, I think we're going to launch these courses over here. And then I think we're going to do this other network over here. And then this, it's like, dude, you haven't even reached a million dollars in revenue yet. If you, you get to a million, you'll probably get the two or 300 K, right? They got to get the launch pad down first, the foundation set before they start doing all this other stuff, right? Because same thing with Apple, right? Same thing with Facebook. They started with colleges first. Apple started with a computer first before they started branching out. Um, so I think, yes, there's an element for expanding, but it's a timing thing too, right? You know, one of the, the, the biggest mistakes for startups is premature scaling. So if you're trying to scale something that, that hasn't exactly taken off yet, like a brand new thing, you're going to start to divert that focus. You're going to start to divert those resources and you're going to fail. And one of the best games for resource management is StarCraft. 
right? It could be any, any strategy game. It could be StarCraft, could be WarCraft. You're managing your resources and you can overexpand and then someone's just going to come and crush you. They're going to overwhelm you, right? Or you can underexpand and then, you know, you're going to slowly get bled away, right? They're going to just move past you and they're going to expand uh, past you in terms of technology. This is why Toby, the founder of Shopify, has said that he will hire any pros in StarCraft because they understand resource management. I grew up playing StarCraft, so I loved it. Another thing you talk about is teamwork, right? So I'm sure you agree. I mean, to build a great organization, you need to get the right people on board, make sure everyone's aligned and rowing in the same direction. I mean, what were some of the lessons that you learned from your esports days when it came to not just, you know, building a team, but also the teamwork? The quote I remember is, if, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with the team. And I also remember this. I was watching this Chinese movie a long time ago. The teacher was like, okay, break this chopstick. Kid breaks it, no problem, right? And then he grabs like 50 chopsticks. Okay, now try to break it. Boom, can't break it, right? And so in the early days when I played uh, games like, you know, Diablo, I was largely soloing, right? I was playing by myself, right? And it felt like, yes, I was making progress. It felt fun, but it didn't feel like I was um, connected, right? And I think the three things that people are looking for in life, they're looking for health, right? They're looking for connection and they're looking to contribute to something bigger than themselves. I didn't exactly have that. So I wasn't taking care of my health. I wasn't exactly connected to anybody and I didn't feel like I was contributing to something bigger than myself. So when I moved on to these other games like EverQuest, I learned that, hey, to get what I wanted long-term, to, to become the strongest version of myself, the best version of myself, I needed to be part of something bigger than myself. And so my mind started to slowly shift into thinking, okay, what can I do best for my team what can I do best for to, to make sure that they're taken care of and then make sure that I perform at a high level? I think it's, you know, I don't have any children, but I think this is why everyone says, you know, when you have children, everything else changes because everything is about the children, right? People's life purpose changes. So anyway, that's how I think about it. And that's how I slowly got my mind to adjust into more of a team first mentality and more of a, hey, I'm going to just keep on giving. And then whatever that's left over for me is just residue from the hard work. Now, there's a really interesting chapter in the book about thievery, right? The idea of stealing ethically. And, and I love that you go into this because you talk about it not just from the standpoint from a poker context, but also like Apple and, and many of their you know, inventions and innovations. Tell me more about the idea of stealing ethically. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the examples I use in the book, um, Apple stole the mouse. They stole the graphical user interface from Xerox, both of these from Xerox. Steve Jobs himself has even said everything in life is just a remix. You have Picasso that said, great artists steal. But if let's go back to Elon's rockets, right? The fundamental design of the rocket looks, the base of it looks the same from what we've seen in the 60s, you know, the 70s. Uh, but the big difference is that these rockets come back and that's no small feat, but it is an iteration on what we've seen in the past, right? Even Google has said their algorithms. I remember when their Matt Cutts, their head of search spam in, in the past, he was like, if you have a, a piece of content that's 10 to 30% unique, we consider that original. And that's like life too, right? Think of it, an algorithm is based on that, but the algorithm is based on how us humans think for the most part. We hold this whole thing about, you know, having to be original, to be so sacred. And it's just like, dude, the reason I use such a kind of a, I hate using the word visceral, but like, you know, this, this visceral word around thievery, it's like, no, no, like I'm original, like I have to be original, but that's so much pressure. The reality is you just have to iterate a little bit one step at a time, right? I talk about getting 1%, leveling up 1% every day, and that's totally fine. And what ends up happening is, you know, over a 5, 10, 15, 20 per year period of time, you do have something that's completely original. So, And speaking of the 1% the better, right, from James Clear and the Atomic Habits, there's another uh, aspect that you mentioned in the book uh, where James Clear defines like the four burners of life, right, being like health, family, friends, and work. And you state essentially these are the four games that you can play, but you're not able to play them simultaneously or at least at an elite level. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I, I think there's seasons in life. I mean, going back to the four burners theory, and I, I think that's a great blog post, um, which is why I put in the book. And by the way, see, that's pulling inspiration and, and giving them credit for it, right? And by the way, I could have, part of my mind crossed, I was like, oh, like, maybe I should try to make this stuff original, right? But then it's just like, dude, just cite them, right? So there's family, there's health, there's work, there's friends. And I think it's it's hard to maintain all of them at the same time, because if you're going gung ho on your business right now, you're probably going to have to dial it back on hanging out with your friends or, or playing a lot of games with your friends. Right. And sometimes people might be dialed up completely on family 
and they might be dialed up completely on work, but then they start to let their their health deteriorate, right? And they maybe when you go crazy on family, right? By the way, if you have a couple of kids, whatever, I think that's all great. But then maybe you stop hanging out with your friends that much. So it's it's different seasons. I think when you're in your twenties, you're hanging out with your friends a lot more, or you might be going crazy on business. You're not going so crazy on on maybe family anymore. It's like a like a stove, right? But you can only max out at high on, you know, maybe two of them at a time, maybe three if you're like really, really, really crazy. So. Yeah. I love how you state that everybody has a different path in life, but there's no skipping levels. Okay. Because th this is the whole idea of like leveling up. Tell me more about that. You don't deserve to go to the next level until you beat the current one. And that's, that's just life, but you don't have to go to the next level if you don't want to go there. So let's say you get a business to a million dollars a year or eight figures a year and you're happy. Everything's good. Why do you have to go push it to nine or, or even 10 figures, right? You can if you want to, but I think it's constantly asking yourself why, why, why? But just in light, like in the end of the book, I had this thing, uh, the wealth ladder, which is from the CEO of ConvertKit. And um, life starts out, right? You go to school and um, you start to build great habits and then you get a job. And then after that, maybe you can start a side hustle while your full-time job is paying you to cover your costs. And then if that works out, you can level it up to an agency or you can level up to like a, a full-on e-commerce store, right? And then you can take those cash flows and reinvest it. And then you can go build a platforms business or like a network effects business, right? Then you can go build a SpaceX if you want to. Um, you can also become an investor, right? And some of these are not mutually exclusive, but it's like there's rungs to the ladder and you know there's no shortcutting it. Um, you have to put in the same work that other people put in. Because the thing is, if you try to shortcut it, let's say you took your business and then gave it to one of your relatives right now. Let's say it's an eight or nine figure business. They didn't do the required work to, to level up, to run the business. They're not going to know what to do with it, which is why you see a lot of people that, uh, that win you know, these lottery tickets right, or the lottos, they end up squandering all the money. Right? They don't know how to control it. They don't know what to do with it. I think athletes are, no, are another good example. I think the ones that have, you know, they're like, okay, I don't really know what to do with the money. I'm, I should have a, maybe an advisor. I'm not recommending this, but they're like, okay, maybe these people might know a little more than me. Maybe we'll have them manage the money, right? I'm not saying that's the right way, but that's just what happens versus the ones that are just like, oh, I'm going to try to manage it. I'm going to party. I'm going to overextend. And then what ends up happening afterwards was they didn't train up their money skills, right? They didn't level up in terms of money and thinking about things long-term and the 20, 30, 40 million, $50 million they made during their career. And they're, you know, maybe in their mid thirties, it's all gone. Eric, we talked to a lot of successful business leaders on this podcast. And one of the things that they've all had in common, I found is that they all have routines. So whether that's a certain morning routine or, or whatever it is that they're doing that help to keep them operating at a consistently high, you know, peak state on a daily basis. W what are some of the routines that you found helpful? You know, one of the big things for me is a pre power up to the next day. So I, you know, spent a good good chunk of money on sleep optimization. So, you know, before, you know, I would sleep it with a room with no AC on. Now I sleep at 68 degrees. I put tape on my mouth, actually, that increases my REM sleep by about 30 minutes. Um, I measure my sleep with an aura ring. And then I, I, I use something called an eight sleep, which will measure my movement. And then also it'll cool my bed. Um, and then I have a nice, you know, air filter in the room. So all this to say is that I didn't think sleep was too important in the past, but then you realize that sleep is actually a massive power up for you. Think about all the time you spend sleeping. And so when my day starts, I'm already off. That's already one power up right? Like I'm, I'm rested, ready to go. And then boom, I, I add the journal and I had the meditation and I had the Peloton in, right? I had the body workout in that's five power ups right there. And then I had the intermittent fasting and that's six, right? So I'm buffed six times already and I'm ready to go. Some people are even crazier that they might have like 12 buffs, 15 buffs, right? But I think the sleep optimization piece is, is, uh, is really nice. And uh, there's a great Ted talk on this called, uh, why we sleep. Excellent Ted talk. Now, Eric, as we come to a close, this being the, the Game Changing Attorney podcast, you're certainly a game changer, but what does that mean to you? We'll use the Steve Jobs remix thing again. You know, what I've written in this book, The Power Ups, I, I think it's just my remix of it, taking my gaming background and then taking my, my marketing and business background. It's the intersection. So I think, you know, all of us have a unique story and that unique story can be a game changer for somebody else. And it's, it's our unique story. It's our unique perspective. I think anybody can do it. There's obviously going to be a lot of people that end up reading this book, but if there's one thing and only one thing that you could have people take away from it, what would that be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's the apprentice mentality. It's it's just as I said earlier, it's strong strong opinions loosely held, and I think um, you know that forces people to kind of remove the ego as much as possible. I want to give a huge thank you to Eric Sue for taking the time to speak with us today. You know, what particularly resonated for me was when Eric said that we can reframe negativity and psychological pain into a productive driving force to help us grow and develop. And as a business leader, the amount of pain and problems you're willing to endure and work through is oftentimes directly proportional to the rate at which you grow. 
You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast with at least one other ambitious law firm owner who you believe would benefit. And you know what? Maybe more than one. For more information on our interview with Eric Sue, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit GameChangingAttorney.com. And join us next time and we'll be speaking with the co-founder and managing partner of Backus & Shanker, Kyle Backus. Let's talk about what the experience is when the call first comes in. How quickly are we answering it? How responsive? What new technology do we need to be investing in to make it work faster, quicker, better? And then we move to, well, who's meeting with the client and what's happening in that meeting? And so we work through each of these because every step of the process is an opportunity to succeed or fail. That's next time on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Oh,